In Neurologic Disorders Part 2, we're going to take a look at Parkinson's disease and ALS. Starting with Parkinson's disease, it's important to understand this is related to an imbalance in neurotransmitters in the brain. Basically, your dopamine and your acetylcholine are work against each other to balance inhibitory and excitatory effect of muscles. That's normal function. Okay? What happens with Parkinson's, there's an overstimulation of the basal ganglia by acetylcholine. And this is because there is decreased dopamine production or the dopamine that is being produced is destroyed before it should be. Okay? Parkinson's has five stages and the symptoms progressively worsen with each. Treatment for Parkinson's is going to focus on increasing the amount of dopamine or decreasing the amount of acetylcholine in the brain. Okay, we're trying to fix that imbalance. So what are you going to see in your Parkinson's patient? Um, Parkinson's is kind of a classic disease. You can see with the picture on the left of your screen, um, you see those five main symptoms. You see how he's forward tilting, so he has that stooped posture. That's going to change his center of gravity, center of balance. So these patients are at very high risk for injury and falls. Their walk tends to be a short, slow, shuffling gait, kind of like a propulsive gait, you know, with that forward tilting just moving forward. Um, they'll exhibit some bradykinesia or akinesia, where they're moving very, very slowly. Um, and you need to keep this in mind when you're taking care of your patients. Um, I had the privilege uh, when I was in high school, I was a medication aide at the local assisted living facility. Um, and we had this, this beautiful woman, and, and unfortunately she had Parkinson's disease, but um, very well off, very well kept. And, you know, wouldn't you know it, her flipping room was as far as you could get from the dining room as possible. And dinner every night was at 4.30. And if she didn't start walking by 3.15, she was not making it on time. Okay. She would, you know, sit as she would go and, you know, sit down for rest periods. But if she didn't start at least an hour or 15 minutes ahead of time, she was not making it on time. Um, so that very slow movement. Um, Speech-wise, as the disease progresses, they tend to get a slow, monotonous speech, um, just very monotone, uh, no emotion in what they're saying. Um, they could be telling you, I had meatloaf for dinner, and they would say it in the same tone and facial expressions as if they were telling you that they saw a dog get run over by a truck. Um, just just very uh, monotone, um, minimal facial expressions. That kind of fits with that mask-like expression. Um, they do have tremors. They tend to be fine tremors at first, and they may have, it's almost like a pill-rolling tremor of the fingers. Um, as the disease progresses, they'll have difficulty with chewing and swallowing and just completing their ADLs. Um, and towards the later stages, stage four, stage five, you may really start to see mood swings and dementia, um, and some autonomic symptoms because they can affect the autonomic nervous system. You can see issues with orthostatic hypotension, flushing, diaphoresis. Those things are going to increase the risk of falls as well. So risk factors for Parkinson's, um, onset can happen between age 40 and 70, typically. Uh, we do tend to see it more in males versus females. And the latest research is showing there does seem to be a genetic predisposition. Um, but there's a, a thought that environmental toxins and chemicals also play a large role in Parkinson's. Um, we also see this as a consequence of chronic use of antipsychotic meds. So your patients that have been treated, have, have had mental illness and have been treated for a long time, um, typically will develop Parkinson's just as a, as a result of that. It's important to understand so you can communicate with the family that there is no definitive diagnostic procedure for Parkinson's. 
you know, it's not like a stroke where I can do a CT or an MRI and we can see it on the picture and boom, we have a diagnosis. Um, there, there is no definitive diagnostic procedure that says, yes, this is Parkinson's. The diagnosis is based on the clinical manifestations and how they're progressing. Um, but really the patient's response to drug therapy. If we're treating it as if we believe it's Parkinson's, how are they responding? And of course, ruling out other diseases that could be causing these types of symptoms. So there's a lot of meds to treat Parkinson's and it's important you kind of understand what each of the classes do. Your dopaminergics are meds that actually get converted to dopamine in the brain. So that's aimed at increasing the amount of dopamine. Your dopamine agonists, they actually activate the release of the dopamine that's already being produced by the body. Again, the whole idea is to increase the amount of dopamine. Okay, Anticholinergics are really used for symptom control. Um, they're used to manage the tremors and to manage the muscle rigidity that your patient experiences. Your COMT inhibitors, those are going to decrease the breakdown of levodopa. Okay, you'll see a medication that you'll do a card for, carbidopa, levodopa, combination, cinnamon. Um, that's really to, this COMT inhibitor is to help decrease the breakdown of that medication so it stays in the system longer. Your MAOB inhibitors are used to increase dopamine levels. So again, we're trying to get at that root of the problem. And Antiviral medications, you wouldn't necessarily think about this because it's not a virus, but antiviral medications actually stimulate release of dopamine and prevent its reuptake, so keeping it in the synapse for a longer period of time. There's also some surgical management for Parkinson's. Um, these are not first-line treatments. Obviously, we're going to start with medication. Uh, and you know ways to manage the lifestyle and treat the chronic disorder um, but if those are not effective they may look to surgical management um, so one of the first things they can do is a stereotactic pallidotomy so this process actually uses brain imaging uh, to map out the brain and they deliver targeted electrical stimulation to destroy specific pinpoint areas of brain tissue. And they destroy it in those areas that are contributing to the Parkinson's symptoms. So it's a very involved process. The other option they have is a deep brain stimulation where they can actually implant a stimulator into the thalamus and it delivers electrical pulses and the whole idea is to decrease the symptoms, to decrease the tremors and the involuntary movements. They have also, it, latest research has been shown to be uh, pretty helpful, the stem cell transplantation, um, doing it into the basal ganglia, and that showed some improvement. Um, very controversial because some of that research is done with fetal uh, stem cells but it, it has been showing some uh, positive results in the research. So for you as a nurse, really looking at collaborative care, how do we care for these patients? And, you know, we focus on several topics. And the first thing is really about mobility. Um, because of their posture, because of their gait, um, it really puts them at risk for falls. The other thing too is they experience muscle rigidity. So if you're not using your muscles, they're gonna atrophy and break down. So we really wanna focus on improving mobility. So they should be on a daily exercise or activity plan. And yoga is a really good activity that helps your Parkinson patients. We wanna be able to balance, I need to keep them active, but I also wanna keep them safe. Range of motion is really important. Um, postural exercises with PT and OT. So really trying to help them with that posture, stand up straight, um, and really work on their balance and their ability to sit and stand, go from a sitting position to a standing position safely. 
walking techniques for safety and balance. Um, a lot of times they tend to push walkers too far ahead of them um, and are walking too far behind it. So that's something that we can work on um, that they're kind of staying right, you know, inside their walker, thinking about safety and balance. They really need to pace their activity. Um, and again, providing those rest periods. Proper footwear is really important because if they don't have the support, that's gonna make it more difficult for them to walk. Um, we already talked about the assistive devices, walker. The other thing when we think about mobility and also fine motor skills because of the tremors that they have, um, they are prime candidates for adaptive equipment. Um, if you think about buttons on a shirt, a button down shirt, there is no way with the tremors that your Parkinson's patients can really do that. So things that can help zippers tend to be a little bit easier, although sometimes they can struggle at the very bottom, getting the zipper into the, the other part of the zipper. And then once they have that, they can move it up. But a real simple thing that they can do is take the buttons off and put Velcro on the inside of the shirt where it would come together. Uh, be able to uh, keep it together and wear those types of shirts. Um, they tend to have difficulty getting up from a sitting position. I mentioned that earlier. So raised toilet seats are really important. And when they sit down, they really should sit in chairs with arms that they can use to push off in order to stand up. It may be helpful for them to use a rocking motion first you know, kind of get their momentum going before they push off those arms of the chair to stand up. From a nutritional perspective, um, the dietitian definitely needs to be part of the collaborative team, the interprofessional team. Um, we want to watch what their intake is, and they should be weighed weekly to be monitoring if we're starting to see any type of weight loss or nutritional concern. They will need a modified diet, particularly as the disease progresses and they may exhibit problems with swallowing. Um, this could be a you know, mechanical soft diet, it could be a pureed diet, it may involve thickened liquids. Aspiration precautions are going to be very important. Upright, small bites, swallowing one at a time. Okay, very, very important. Because these patients move so slowly, it takes them forever to eat a meal. So you really want to think about how to maximize their nutrition. Having smaller, more frequent meals <coughs> cut into small pieces that they can manage. Okay, that's going to be really important. The other thing is you want to make sure you get the most bang for your buck. So you want high calorie, protein rich foods, calorie dense foods, and not empty calories. You know, chocolate cake has a lot of calories in it, but they're not very helpful, okay? You wanna get the most bang for your buck out of everything that they consume. The other thing to keep in mind is the food that you are serving. Because it takes them so long to eat, food gets cold. I don't know about you, but I don't want to eat cold soup. I don't want to eat cold green beans. So you want to make sure the food is hot on the plate. Okay. And you want to make sure you're serving small amounts. If they want to eat more of something, we can always go back for a second helping. Okay. But don't pile it on there that it gets cold because then they're likely not going to eat it anyway. They might require some adaptive eating devices. Um, sometimes we put, um, things on the spoon to make it uh, a thicker grip. They're almost like a rubber grippy thing that fits on there, that they have more to be able to grasp their utensils. Um, sometimes they use special plates to help them be able to scoop the food onto a spoon or fork. Um, and they may require supplements, vitamins and minerals to try to you know help support that nutrition. From a communication standpoint, they can do exercises, uh, usually this is with speech therapy, uh, to try to strengthen those facial muscles and kind of keep those, that, those facial muscles moving uh, because they tend to have the muscle rigidity and that masked face. Uh, we wanna try to work those muscles. You wanna encourage the client to speak slowly and pause frequently. Okay, let them 
take that time to say what they want to say. Um, as the disease progresses and it gets more difficult for them to speak, you may need to use alternate forms of communication. Uh, picture boards that they can point to, you know, what they're trying to say, what they're, you know, what they need um, are pretty important. So, you know, your speech therapist, your speech language pathologist is a, is a key member of that interprofessional team that should be working for their collaborative care. From a mental and cognitive status, you want to keep the patient as involved as possible for as long as possible. Encourage that socialization, recreation. You want to encourage self-care. We're here to support them, but I want to encourage them to do as much as possible. And I know that sometimes that's difficult because as a nurse, I have five patients I need to take care of and I need to get this, 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 and this time. And it would go so much faster if I did it, but we really want to promote that self-care. Um, involve them in planned activities. Um, support groups, both for the client and the family, because again, this is a chronic progressive disease, and particularly in the end stages where you start seeing the cognitive impairment um, and the dementia, that can be very, very difficult for families uh, to deal with. Uh, very similar to Alzheimer's that like at the end, they, they may not know who that family member is. So that, that's a little concerning. Um, sometimes these patients can experience hallucinations. Uh, the patient I was telling you about before, I, you know, I loved working with her, but it just broke my heart towards the end of her disease process because she was a Holocaust survivor. And sure, her hallucination, she would hallucinate that there were SS men sitting on her couch and just the terror that she had. You know, it's, it's so interesting to see a Parkinson's patient and they have that mask-like expression, but you can read so much in their eyes. And she was just terrified, absolutely terrified um, because in her mind, those SS men were sitting there and they were there to kill her. Um, so it's, it's a real challenge. And you think about um, just trying to support them through that. You know, so you have that, you have other safety risks, you know, the risk for falls like we were talking about. So, you know, of course, no throw rugs around. That's just gonna be a fall hazard. Um, shaving because of the tremors, a real risk for cutting themselves. So uh, definitely no straight razors. I would use that electric razor. And particularly as the disease progresses, um, th they're gonna require supervision. They're gonna require a higher level of care. Okay, switching to ALS, amyotropic lateral sclerosis. It's also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, although our most recent research is telling that Lou Gehrig actually didn't have Lou Gehrig's disease. They think he has something else. So that's kind of interesting. Um, ALS is a degenerative progressive fatal disorder. Um, it's important to understand that it affects the motor neurons. It does not affect the sensory neurons, just the motor neurons. And it causes progressive paralysis and muscle atrophy. Um, so as a result, it, it commonly causes aspiration, pneumonia, and then respiratory failure and death within about three to five years. Um, there is a small percentage of ALS patients, it's about 10%, who actually go on to live, you know, 10 or 20 plus years, but that is very rare. Most of your ALS patients are going to be dead within five years. Um, so that's a realization that they have to come to terms with and they need to think about that end of life planning. Risk factors for ALS, uh, smoking, they've seen some link to different viral infections. It's they classified as an autoimmune disease, uh, perhaps linked to some environmental exposures. They're looking at a genetic link. They do see ALS tends to affect males more than females. There is no clinical lab test specific to the disease, okay? We'll do the EMG, they'll do the muscle biopsy. It will show reduced functioning motor units, okay? So it's really based on those testing and the symptoms and how the patient is progressing. So 
things that the patient will experience. It'll be fatigue, progressive muscle weakness and atrophy. They'll get cramps and twitching. They'll lose coordination. Um, as it continues to progress, they will have overactive deep tendon reflexes. They will have impaired speaking and swallowing and they'll have that nasally sounding voice. Okay, not a whole lot that we can do for ALS. Um, there is a medication that's out there uh, Reluzo. Uh, it's a glutamate antagonist and it has been shown to prolong survival, um, but not by a whole lot. You're talking probably six to 12 months, a year and a half at, at the most, um, that that kind of prolongs things. So our care is really going to be supportive care, you know, supporting body processes, body functioning, dealing with the symptoms, and then we're really looking at end of life care. So we think about, like we mentioned, supporting airway and breathing. Um, it may get to the point where this patient is gonna require uh, a ventilator, long-term vent management. Um, they're always at risk for aspiration, so we worry about respiratory secretion. So pulmonary hygiene uh, is gonna be really important. The coughing, the deep breathing, um, the flutter valve, the incentive spirometry, really trying to keep that respiratory tract free of any type of obstruction or infection. They will get to the point where they'll require enteral nutrition support, and typically that's done by a peg tube. Um, as they have difficulty with communication and talking, uh, you wanna facilitate communication and coping for this patient. Again, remember, this is a disease that affects motor neurons. It doesn't affect sensory neurons at all. So they have sensation of this throughout the entire disease process. Um, and again, as mentioned before, the, the end of life planning, you know, the advanced directive, the hospice, you know, how, how do they want to manage their last days?